Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for waking us up this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, that we may be washed and cleansed in that blood, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord God, for the great sacrifice, Heavenly Father, that we may now come to you as sons and daughters, Lord God, washed in the blood, righteous and holy, Heavenly Father. Your children, Lord God, thank you, Lord. You've made us part of your family, Lord God, and we thank you. We ask that you continue to anoint us with the Holy Spirit as we await our place in heaven that has been prepared for us by your Son, your plan, Lord God. Let us hold on to that in our hearts. Let us always hold on to that as a sign of just how much you love us, Lord God. Let us not lose touch with the fact of just how much you love us. The knowledge of that love will erase all of our fears, Lord God, and we can stand tall with no condemnation, knowing that we will meet you, we will be called home, and we will have glory in your name and live with you forever. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I just want to thank God for bringing me here to morning, this morning. I want to thank all the people here today who, you know, took time to come here and fellowship with all of us. You know, because, and it's funny, the, 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 the name of the, the word for the sermon today was uh, wait. You know? And when you're in that moment and you're looking at God, you can see God's hand. You can hear God's talking to you. You see the confirmation of what it is you believe his calling for you is. You know, I had to wait this morning. Yeah. Okay? It was not my plan to not be here at 11 o'clock. Our plan was to go to Starbucks, come here. <laughs> but my point is, it was my plan, not God's plan. And when God revealed his plan to me, you know, I had to wait. That's all I had to do. You know, a lot of thoughts might run through your head. A lot of ideas might come to your, to your mindset. But more importantly, oftentimes, we need to wait. We need to be quiet, we need to listen, but more importantly, we just need to wait. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, when you're young, when I was young, the last thing I could do was wait. Couldn't wait. Had all the time in the world, but couldn't wait. Had to have it now. Didn't have enough time to wait. As I got older, I have much less time now. Much less time. But it's ironic. I've learned to wait. Got less time. Time is the most important thing we have, most valuable thing we have. But I can wait longer now. I can actually sit and wait for a long time. And that's the beauty sometimes of, of going through life and trying to get an understanding of life. You know, I thought I was 61 years old. I told my wife, the lady at the church, at the business, you see, one of the patients was 61, and she referred to him as an old man. And then she realized, wait a second, she started laughing, and she apologized. She said, well, Doc, that's why you're 61. I was like, no problem. You know, I'm, I'm proud to have made 61 years old. You know, I didn't think I was going to live to be 40. Oh, man, 61. I, I, I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm grateful, you know, and, you know, through the grace of God, I don't have a bucket list, okay? Because <laughs> everything I wanted to do, I did before I was the age of 40, and then some. So, you know, praise God. But my point is, is that we got to wait, and we got to learn how to wait. We got to wait, and we got to learn how to wait. Let me get on with the scripture here. Psalm 34, 4 through 5. I sought the Lord... And he answered me. Hallelujah. I sought the Lord and he answered me. You know, God is there right beside us all the time. But we have so many distractions. 
that we don't even see. So, you know, we got to stand still for a moment, wait a little bit, and realize we got to seek God. It's ironic we have to seek Him because He's right there, right beside us. But we still have to seek Him. And what that means is, is that we got our minds so preoccupied with all the things that we need to do. It's like a maze and a puzzle. And if we're all, in order for us to realize the reality of our circumstances, which is He is right there beside us, you'd be surprised at how much work we have to do to get to that point and realize that. You know, it's like that old saying, I know, a lot, I know a lot of people like it, you know, they talk about, you know, I was you know, walking on the beach in the footsteps, mm -hmm. you know, and where were you? Well, you know, those were my footsteps and I was the one that was carrying you. That's what I'm talking about. Thank but how long does it take to realize that? It can take years before we come to that awareness. So we do have to seek the Lord. You know, we've got to turn off and focus and seek God, Hallelujah. even though he's right there beside us. But anyway, I sought the Lord and he answered me. If you seek God, he will answer you. I guarantee you. You won't hear the answer if you're not seeking him. And that just doesn't mean for a minute. You know, if you lose your keys and you start searching for them, how long, or excuse me, if you lose your engagement ring or wedding band and now you need to find it, how or very important, if you lose your whole paycheck in cash money, how long are you going to spend looking for that? Hold we all know how long we're going to spend looking for that. That's what I mean by seek and sought the Lord. And when he answers you, he will deliver you from all your fears. You see? Doesn't mean he said, oh, I hear you, here I am. No, that's what we're talking about. The answer was, whatever it was you were going through, whatever it was was too much for you to handle, whatever it was you needed help with, he delivered you from that, and whatever fear was attached to that, he delivered you from that fear. Why? Because you sought him. <clears throat> Those who look to him are radiant. When he delivers you, when you realize that he's always been right beside you, when you realize all you need to do is keep your eye on him and your awareness on the fact that he is right there, helping you, holding you. When you realize that your look to him, you will be radiant. Amen. Because you don't have the fear anymore. He's taken that away. You realize how much he loves you. Hallelujah. You realize how much he cares for you. You realize it's only through his grace that you had that deliverance. There is nothing any of us can do to earn God's grace and his favor. That's right. Absolutely nothing. Look at Job. Job was considered a righteous man. Satan even pointed him out. And Satan said to the Lord, he's righteous only because of how you've blessed him. And God said, not so. Well, let's test it and see. And Job was tested. Everything was taken from Job. Family, wealth, health, everything. Snatched right away. Job was human. And even in the end, Job did question God. Something we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to question God. And God chastised him for that question. In a nice way. But like he said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When I determined the line where they would be laying and see? 
Where were you, Joe? And then he goes on and on. I can't remember all the scripture, but you get the point. Yeah, yeah. Who are you to question me? You see, as human beings, because we were created in God's image, deep down inside, we have a problem with that. You see, we don't like being talked to like that. But in Job's humble state, and when we really need God in our humble state, we'll listen to talk like that. And God told him. And he remained humble. And in the end, God restored everything back to him. Hallelujah. Two, three, four, five times more than he had in the beginning. Now I'm sure if you asked Job, prior to all that happening, if you asked him how much faith do you have, you know, he probably said an awful lot. As much as I need. Probably would have said, I can't imagine having any more than what I have. But think about Job after what he went through, and then God restored him five, four, five, four, four afterwards. How much more faith do you think Job had after that experience? Hmm. And my point is, no matter what level of faith that you think you have, there's another level that you can go to if you're seeking the Lord. Hallelujah. Because until you have that radiant face that's never covered with shame, you see, we do all sorts of wicked things against the will of the Lord. We commit sin all the time. I don't care how strong our walk is. Look at all the men in the Bible. David sinned with uh, the lady. What's her name? Bathsheba. Thank you. Moses struck down the guard. Paul was killing all the Christians. You see, many men in the Bible, uh, Abraham and Sarah, you know, Abraham gave the, the, the maid servant to Abraham for the child. Couldn't wait on the promise. We will all sin and disappoint, I want to say disappoint, but not meet the expectations that we might have for pleasing the Lord. But it doesn't matter. You don't have to have shame. Because there's nothing we can earn from God. There's nothing we can do all the time to please God. All we have is the grace. And when you understand that grace, and when you just accept that grace, and then you just work on seeking the Lord. And you get to the point where you can see him all the time. And he becomes your best friend holding your hand, which he's been doing anyway. When he becomes your best friend and you see it and you know it and you live it, you will have no shame. And your face will be radiant. And you won't hold any expectations on yourself or anyone else. Because you know there's nothing you can do or have done to earn this standing with the Lord. It's a gift, a precious gift. Psalm 16, 8. I have set the Lord continually before me. This is the next level. You see, I have set the Lord continually before me. That means when you're walking and your eyes and your senses are detecting your surroundings, you see, your eyes don't really see Jesus in front of you. That's the connection between your heart and your soul. You see, it really starts in the heart. You know, in, the, in my business, they talk about the thoughts dictate the, the, the feelings, and the feelings dictate the, the, the behavior. Whatever you're thinking, good or bad, your feelings don't be attached to it. Bad thought, bad feeling. Bad feeling, bad behavior. But it all starts in the heart. The heart is what your beliefs come from. That's your core. That's where the belief comes from. When Saul was made king and anointed, the first thing the Lord did was he purified and gave him a new heart. We have that ability to get that purification in that new heart, but we can still corrupt it along the way. You know, we can do that all on our own. 
But once you have that purified heart, and how do you purify your heart? By going through the fire. That's the purification process. And once you start believing in this, you know, really believing it in your heart, that's when you can set the Lord continually before you. You see? You don't even, it's not even a, something you have to go back to. It's something you're doing and you're at. And you can see yourself slip away and then you pull yourself right back into it and there he is in front of you. You see, that's the level you want to get to. Not when you're running around doing your own thing and then when something goes wrong and you get all upset or whatever, whatever's going on, and you start getting afraid, and then you go like, whoa, wait a second, that's like Jesus. Let me call on Jesus. That's good. But you want to be at the point where he's always in front of you. Always. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is my right hand. You can talk about your right hand man. What's that mean? You know what I'm talking about. Your right hand. That's the person you can trust. You know, that's, that's your go-to person. You know, your right hand and left hand. If you're left hand, it was your left hand. Okay, your right hand. Your right hand. That's your main source of what it is you have to get things done during the day. That's your mojo. See, God's got to be continually before you. And he is your right hand. That's the level we want to get to. Hallelujah. You see? That's faith. Faith takes you there. Faith. And faith comes from the heart. Because you got to believe it. Believe it completely. I shall not be moved. See? That means when the car breaks down, nobody's sitting in the pews in the church. Whatever it is, whatever you want to name or point out, you shall not be moved. Doesn't mean you won't have a feeling, but it means you won't be moved from what you know that calling and that purpose is. You will continue to see him in front of you. He will continue to lead you and guide you. And you will continue in that path. We're going to have feelings. You know, they're there. You know, and I like, and we talked about earlier about the end times. One of the reasons why I think it's the end times, because, you know, and, and no disrespect, fellas, but we got a lot of people committing suicide. I don't know if any of y'all noticed this or not. Okay? But there's a lot of people committing suicide. You know, when you commit suicide, what that means in my world is it is more painful to live than it is to just move on. Or you're so afraid of catastrophe that you'd rather just get it over then deal with the anticipation and all that's associated with the belief that it's inevitable. That tells me it's end time. And you know why? Because I feel this. Because the Lord put it in my spirit and gave me the calling and the ability to feel things and feel people's emotions. You know, it's hard out here in the world right now. It is hard to make it in this world. I don't know, in, I'll say in America, because I think America is probably the best country to live in. So we don't even have to go outside America. I can't even imagine how hard it is outside America. You know, we think poor, poor here in America is rich in some of these other countries. That's right. But my point is, in America, which is supposed to be the leader, it is hard to get through the day. It's hard. I don't care who you are, what you got, what you're doing, it is hard. And it is getting harder every year or so. It just is. You can't tell me, anybody out here working, don't tell me the job has gotten harder. <coughs> and amen on that, as the job gotten harder, anybody's working, 
when you look back on it, it's harder. Amen. It's just more stuff coming at you. Lord have mercy. It, it's, it's amazing. Psalm 46.10. So, we got all this contention. We got all these things coming at us. You know? So, what we do? Well, we, we got to believe. We got to pray for more faith. We got to look on our faith and, and see God in front of us and know He's right beside us. We got to be able to wait on the Lord. But sometimes it's not so much what we do, it's what we don't do. Hallelujah. You see? That's really what it comes down to when you're here. It ain't really when you're walking with Christ. It really ain't what you're doing. Because there's nothing you can do to earn his, you know, blessing. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much what you're doing. It's what you're not doing. Our mercy, God. You see? Because we get caught up in all these other things to divert our attention that do divert our attention from him. Right. Uh-huh. If you're trying to captivate your thoughts and keep them obedient to Christ, you can't be off on a mission hmm. or a task. You got to be still and waiting. So the, the, the thing says there, stop striving. Everybody in America think they got to be doing something to get ahead you know, God, God, yeah, 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 but you know what? He still wants us to do things. How many times do you hear this from other fellow Christians? As if to say, if you ain't helping God with this thing here, you're doing something wrong. You're the problem. You're part of the problem if you ain't doing something to fix it. You see, that's what the world tells us, and we believe it. Because that's our nature. We think we got to be part of the solution, which means we got to be doing something. But that's that's not it. We got to stop doing stuff. We got to stop striving. And know that I am God. See, that's God talking to us. Stop doing, I don't need your help. Please, stop trying to help me. I got this. I'm God. Not you. I call the shots here. I'm in charge of this program. Don't need your help. Nothing you can do can please me or make me feel any differently about you. I gave you everlasting love. I gave you love. I gave you everything. I'm continuing to give you everything. Stop it. I got this. I will let that stay up there. Hallelujah. This fellowship was formed a few years back. My calling and ministry is with people with addictions. You know, I was always good at, the Lord always made me good at coming up with names and putting spins on things. You know, everyone is born addicted to the world. We are going to start, we must be recovery specialists. And we must assist, assist people in the recovery of that birth of being born in the world and addicted to the world. We must help them recover from that and lead them to that point where they have that level of faith and see things in that way. That's our mission. That's our purpose. The only way besides prayer that we'll find those people is if they are humble 
Anybody who's all puffed up about what they can do and what they can't do, that's why the achievers, the ones who have achieved the most in the world, are sometimes the hardest ones to, to get to listen to anything because they don't have any humility. You see, we need humble people. We need to reach out to the humble. Hallelujah. And the humble people are usually the people that have messed up. So that's what we're going to be reaching out to. You see, and we're all going to become recovery specialists. We're going to help people recover from their condition, their falling condition. And let them understand that, yes, end times are near. And yes, it's going to be difficult, extremely difficult. But this is how you need to approach this. And this is how you can do this so that you will not only survive through this, but you will thrive in the next life. Amen. And that's the message that we have to get out to our people. People thirsty. People that come through that door. Let it be. And that's our purpose. That will be our mission. And through the grace of God, it will be our achievement through his power, his grace, his plan. Amen. So be it.